afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition to our Westry Horn Cultural Heritage Lecture Series with Frontiers International Plainfield Area Club. I am Safir Jenkins, president of Frontiers International Plainfield, and I'm your host for today. And it gives me great privilege and honor to welcome you not only to our broadcast, but to introduce you to a powerhouse and dynamic leader uh, in the area of midwives uh, and the profound impact that it has on the community that it serves, the communities that it serves. Uh, this role uh, as a midwife is impactful. And for many of us, we have limited knowledge about how deeply rooted those implications are spread throughout our community and how profound the impact has been to allow us to continue to thrive as a people. Uh, with me today, though, I have the prestigious uh, opportunity to introduce all of you to Linda Holmes. Uh, Linda Janet Holmes is a writer and former director of the New Jersey Office of Minority and Multicultural Health, and she is a women's health activist dedicated to supporting the birthing justice movement. Her most recent book, Safe in a Midwife's Hands, Birthing Traditions from Africa to American South, focuses on the practices of Black midwives whose holistic approaches are essential counterbalances to a medical system that routinely fails Black mothers and babies. A longtime resident of East Orange, New Jersey, Ms. Holmes now lives in Hampton, Virginia. And she so graciously agreed to join us today. So join me as we welcome to today's broadcast as part of our lecture series, Ms. Linda Janet Holmes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, to those of you who are listening to this conversation, as was mentioned, I am here in Hampton, Virginia, where I now live. But I um, spent most of my life up until 10 years ago in East Orange, New Jersey. And as also was mentioned, I um, headed the Office of Minority and Multicultural Health for several years. And I also worked at the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey in the um, nurse midwife program there. And I recently learned that that program is celebrating um, 50 years of um, midwifery education um, which is now moved to Rutgers University. And Shirley White, who lives in Plainfield, um, will be a midwife who will be honored at the 50th anniversary. Uh, she was the first black midwife to graduate from that program. So you have a gem of a midwife right there in Plainfield. And hopefully you might consider inviting her on and maybe some of the local midwives in New Jersey um, because the struggle for midwives to continue is ongoing. The struggle to increase access to midwives um, in various settings, whether it's a birth center, whether it's at home or whether in hospital continues. I am attending a um, black midwife conference um, here in Hampton uh, this weekend. And in fact, when I was asked to do this um, conversation, this lecture, I thought, oh, I can't do this conversation lecture because I'll be in the heart of conversations with Black midwives from across the country and the diaspora. But in fact, it is a, it is a, a nice link. Um, I just finished chairing a conversation with midwives, um, senior midwives, with decades and decades and decades and decades of experiences working in various settings. Um, but they're closing comments was to kind of set the alarm bell, which to say that the problem of access to midwives, particularly Black midwives in Black communities, continues to be a problem. And of course, we're all aware of the birthing justice movement in terms of uh, Black women being three, sometimes four times more likely to die in childbirth. Um, midwives are known for having positive outcomes, for being 
present with the mother and the baby and the family, um, encouraging family-centered birthing care, encouraging um, minimum use of interventions such as uh, pharmaceutical interventions, and really encouraging the family to be involved with the birth experience as opposed to the mother being isolated in labor and delivery. But these midwives who I've just been listening to just minutes ago were really ringing the alarm bell because many of the black midwives who've been practicing for years and years that they're finding that they are increasing the criteria for um, midwives to practice in various settings. And so now many of the hospitals are moving towards, you know, the PhD midwife, as opposed to a midwife who has acquired her skills through various methods, whether it be apprenticeship or like Shirley at the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey, but making it more difficult, not less difficult for black women and women of color to access midwives. But I thought I would start by um, reading a section from my book that I have read. Um, I actually read it when I was um, uh, honored to do my first book signing at the Plainfield um, Library. But I read it because it will kind of bring you into my personal story and why it is that um, for several decades now, um, I, you know, I'm in my 70s now, so I go, this, this fire that started burning in me actually began with my own childbirth experience, which happened to have been at St. Joseph's Hospital. So I'm just going to read a few paragraphs from the opening of the book, which is called My Journey. When I gave birth at St. Joseph's Hospital in Patterson, New Jersey in 1976, I had no idea that my childbirth experience would launch a lifetime of work. 45 years later, I remain committed to activism and write in support of a growing birthing justice movement that aims to end inequities in birthing care and outcomes. I dedicate the stories in this book to that movement. The fire I bring to this work still burns from my engagement in the 1960s Black Student Revolutionary Movement on the Rutgers University campus. I was among the Black students who raised our fists in making demands that challenged structural racism, the abysmal lack of Black faculty, and classes focusing on Black history and Black student underrepresentation in the student population at this state-funded institution. Preparing for giving birth, six years later, felt like readying myself for a Black Power March on campus. But this time, the demand centered on seizing the power to make the choices about my childbirth experience. To prepare for childbirth, my partner Welton Smith and I took classes with Elizabeth Bing, known as the mother of Lamaze, in her apartment on a Manhattan Upper, side, Upper East Side. Welton, a journalist and a poet, was widely recognized for capturing the spirit of Malcolm X in his poems, first published in Black Fire, edited by the revolutionary poet Amiri Baraka. As we prepared to give birth to our daughter, Ajoa Ghana Frisco Tashi Smith, we were the only Black couple in the Lamaze class at that time. Despite my preparation and determination to have my wishes respected, doctors administ administered Pitocin, a drug used to stimulate labor, and ordered an epidural, a procedure that injects a local an anesthesia into the mother. In an act of self-empowerment, I refused to agree to an epidural unless my partner would be in the delivery room to provide emotional support. We also learned that, um, and I'm gonna stop there, but we also learned that um, breastfeeding was not supported at the time by the nursing staff. There was no rooming in. I happened to have been an uninsured mom, unmarried at that time. And I was making demands as a black woman. Um, and at first there was this kind of sense of, wow, this woman is actually wanting to have her baby without having painkillers. That's really weird. Um, and so instead of the nuns coming to support me by rubbing my back, holding my hand, I became this kind of showcase. And then, 
after several hours had passed and I still had not reached the point of being able to naturally release my baby, then that's when I was told it was time for the epidural. And we had learned in our classes that oftentimes um, if you haven't had your baby, by the time doctors like to go play golf, which is around three o'clock in the afternoon, that's when they become really fired up about, okay, let's do the epidural. And as a matter of fact, my daughter was born at 345. So about an hour before there was um, a sense that it's urgent that we get this baby out and we want to make sure the baby's safe, that the mom is safe. And I said, no way, unless my partner, Ghana's dad, was in the uh, birthing space with me. So I think it was also revolutionary at the time to be able to give birth in that space um, and have my partner with me at the time. We also did um, had rooming in. And I mention all of that because reflecting back again today on what the midwives were discussing is that the problems still persist, particularly for Black women to be heard to be listened to in the birthing space. Um, and even on the flip side, there was a recent study that was done at the University of Virginia, which talked about times when mothers wanted uh, pain, relief for the pain. Um, so I was talking about wanting a natural childbirth and others for various reasons wanted um, medication. And what they learned from their very specific scientific study was that white women who requested pain medication were readily provided with that medication. Whereas black women, when they requested medication, were told you can tolerate the pain, bear with it, get through it. And the results of that study were published in a major journal, medical journal, just four years ago, showing that there was bias among the doctors because they reported to the researchers that they believed that black women could tolerate pain better than white women. So across the board, whether you're seeking a natural childbirth or um, requiring interventions, the issue of race and the issues of racism and reasons that call for the, the birthing justice movement. But back to my story, I, um, I was outraged <laughs> by the treatment that I received at St. Joseph's Hospital. And I, um, I guess maybe my daughter was, I was still breastfeeding when I decided to go back to uh, Rutgers and pursue a degree in, in public administration. And while there, I, this is Rutger Snork. While there, I really focused my research on, it was, it was really uh, motivated by my personal experience, but I did research on what was the law in New Jersey about becoming a midwife? Who could be a midwife? I looked at um, insurance. If you had a, a private insurance, would your insurance cover um, a midwife? Again, we're talking the 1970s. I also designed a survey instrument, which I um, developed with my uh, faculty advisors to survey some of the black women at what was then called Martlin Hospital in Newark. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Martlin Hospital. Jokingly, folks used to call it the, not the hospital, but the horse spittle based on how people were being treated there. Um, so I went to the chairperson of the department, who at that time was Dr. Kamenetsky, and I said, I have a survey here, and I would like, I'm a student at Rutgers, and I would like an opportunity to survey the women um, who utilize the hospital in the maternity and infant care clinic um, to see if they have an interest in having greater choices in their childbirth experiences. This is 1978. What happened was Dr. Kamineski looked at me and he said, you don't understand. The women who we care for in our clinic are um, not married. Many of them are on drugs. 
Many of them are um, addicted to alcohol and on and on and on. And therefore, they will have no interest in um, having a midwife uh, by choice or having um, breastfeeding options or uh, being awake and aware for the birth experience. And that was the second fire. So the first fire was my childbirth experience. The second fire was this the chair of the OBGYN department expressing his racism and judgments about women accessing care at Martin Hospital at the time. And that led me to um, apply for a position with the nurse midwife program at the medical school at that time. And the final fire, before I talk about what I've learned from the work that I've done, is that the nurse midwife program at that time focused their history of midwifery totally on the practices of white midwives, white nurse midwives, whose practices began in the, I think the early 1930s in rural Kentucky and Appalachia. There was no acknowledgement of indigenous, indigenous, indigenous midwives, immigrant midwives, and there was an excellent study done about immigrant midwives in North New Jersey back in the 20s, where they showed that the immigrant midwives actually had better outcomes than the doctors did, and it was published in the Journal of Public Health. And a total, complete um, wiping out of the generations and generations and generations of Black midwifery care in this country, which succeeded in saving the lives of countless mothers and babies. My work focused um, in the Deep South, but what we know is that really up until the 1920s, that even in Northern communities, um, midwives were very much involved with birthing cares for particularly for uh, low income black women. For example, um, um, one of our more uh, well-known um, writers um, talks about Toni Morrison. I'm doing all this without notes. <laughs> This is all coming from my heart. Toni Morrison talks about her great-grandmother, who was a midwife in, um, I think it was Chicago. And in Chicago, she said about her great-grandmother that how much respect she had, because whenever she walked into the room, the men would stand up. And that she said about this woman that she felt her authority more than she felt her own authority. So I think the other thing to understand that black midwives from time immemorial, so time immemorial begins obviously on the continent in Africa. Women have been the caregivers for women at the time of birth. White men entered the delivery space quite recently um, at the end of the 19th century, um, but in the black community in the United States, particularly in the South, in places like Alabama and in some parts of Virginia where I now live, more than 70% of the mothers and babies born had been attended by a black midwife. The other thing that's worth noting is that black midwives not only attended black women, they also attended white women. And since I've been living in Virginia, um, many of you might be aware of the recent recognition of the landing, forced landing of the first Africans in Virginia in 1619. So we know that certainly women were attending women in childbirth in Virginia as early as 1619. We also know that in Virginia, Harriet Tubman, um, who her, her contributions in terms of attending births, that's not what she's known for, but we do know that she had, in terms of being an underground railroad champion, certainly attended 
births there that might not have been planned. But she also visited during the Civil War uh, Fort Monroe, which is in Virginia, which is also the landing space. And she observed the, the fact that Black women who were attending um, births had much better outcomes than, um, than doctors. And this was observed also by a white doctor who was observing Black midwives working in a Jim Crow segregated hospital. And he writes quite clearly how impressed he was with the Black midwives' skills. Unfortunately, um, the campaigns to rid Black midwives from, um, from their historic practices, um, which began really in the 1920s. And it was argued that Black midwives had worse outcomes than doctors. Um, and the statistics um, did not take into account whether these women were at risk for other reasons, um, including, you know, sun up, sun, sun up to sundown work, um, lack of access to uh, needed medical care that, that might have made them um, less at risk when having their babies. But there was, and there was no recognition of midwives who were successful. Um, in my previous book, um, Listen to Me Good, I wrote about Margaret Charles Smith, who attended more than 3,000 births in her community. And she never lost a mother. And she might have had maybe two or three stillborns. And she was later recognized by the Congressional Black Caucus um, as an extraordinary traditional midwife and healer in um, Utah, Alabama. So the campaign to discredit midwives across the board had a lot to also do with stereotyping, um, racism, and um, not looking at other factors that might have contributed to the less than positive outcomes for um, underserved, for, for black women living in underserved um, communities. But what I would like to close with, because again, I'm doing this amazingly <laughs> without any notes, is that um, I did my research as a result of a fellowship that I received from the National Endowment for the Humanities back in 19, 81. And I went to Alabama because, and I hope my voice hand holds up as well, but I went to Alabama in 1981 because all of the midwives who were still practicing um, in 1978 when they passed the law to eliminate midwifery practices, um, it was not difficult to find midwives to interview and ask them about their work why they became midwives, about their traditions, about their um, midwife lineage. Many of the midwives, their mama was a midwife, their grandmama was a midwife, their great-grandmama was a midwife, which meant that they had apprenticed with someone in their family, um, sometimes at a very, very early age, and that their elders who were midwives were not just midwives, they were frequently um, holistic care providers. So they not only cared for the mom at the time of birth, but they would also be known for having in their garden, you know, uh, growing catnip tea and other teas that might be helpful if the baby, the infant was having, you know, minor problems um, that the midwife would be the one consulted. And the midwife, also would be consulted um, by folks that she delivered because she was seen as a wise woman. One of my friends said that whenever he, he was from Selma, Alabama, but whenever he came back home to visit, he always went to see the midwife because she was considered much more than a birth attendant. She was a tradition keeper. She was a wise woman. She was um, holistic 
and she provided guidance in many, many aspects of life and was honored um, in the community. So I was interested in trying to document from the voices of the midwives, their stories, why they entered midwife, midwifery, what were their challenges. And of course their challenges included um, at times when they needed to have access to medical care or medical backup, when there was an emergency, um, up until really the 1960s, there was you know harsh uh, Jim Crow segregation. And if the hospital did permit you to come in to have your baby or be cared for, oftentimes it was in the basement. Uh, one woman was telling me about the, the pipes bursting while she was having her baby in the basement of a hospital. Um, so that the preferred, even in the early stages of desegregation, it was preferred to have birth at home and not encounter the kind of racism and demeaning treatment, which of course we still experience, and that's what we're talking about in the birthing justice movement, that just moving, the moving birth into the hospital has not only failed to provide equity, but also failed in terms of, of outcomes. Um, and as I said, um, my experiences in interviewing midwives told a completely different story about outcomes than what um, we were seeing in the earlier reports where they were really uh, looking at the data in terms of looking at all midwives, whether or not they had attended one or two births or whether they had attended thousands of births. So that wasn't whether or not they had access to backup medical care, whether or not they did not have access to backup medical care. So um, there was a study that was done in North Carolina more recently, um, looking at midwifery, black midwives outcomes. Um, and just one more note about having access to um, medical care if needed. The midwife that I interviewed and listened to me good, she talked about what she would have to do if she had an emergency she would have to travel to Tuskegee because Tuskegee Hospital was the only hospital that would um, accept black patients. And that meant traveling, and this is, we're talking now in the 40s and the 50s, so we're not talking about interstates. This meant traveling more than an hour and a half uh, to reach backup medical care. So those kind of factors were not uh, recorded in the studies that were used to, uh, justify a quote unquote, the elimination of, of black midwives at the time. But the study that I'm referring to was more recent in 1960, where midwives um, outcomes were compared with doctor outcomes. And the study um, was published in a major medical journal. Uh, it might've been a public health journal where they looked at women who received prenatal care at a public health supported clinic, but the midwife attended the birth of these women in, in one group and doctors attended the births in another group. And what they found is that there was no statistically different significance in the outcomes. And in fact, the midwives actually had slightly better outcomes than the doctors. And these were women who might've had a high school education uh, they were not nurses. They entered the field of midwifery through taking courses, maybe a six week course at a historically black college, um, Hampton, Virginia State, or some of the schools, Tuskegee, that offered courses to midwives, but certainly not on par in terms of the formal education that doctors had. These are the, the facts that um, never really saw the light of day and I think it's unfortunate that the um, African-American community to some extent um, accepted, particularly those who did not have a personal experience with a black midwife, the idea that the, most, the best care from the most qualified caregivers come from in-hospital birth. Um, and also, and I'm just, I want to conclude with this because I want to get back to Africa because also um, the idea was that the traditional midwives in the South were quote, superstitious 
Um, they were um, not uh, scientific, um, et cetera. And when I did my interviews, I interviewed 50 black midwives in Alabama in 1981 who had been forced out of practice without any assessment of their skills. When I interviewed these midwives, I asked them about their traditions. And their traditions included um, the use of herbs um, and not being um, dependent on pharmacolo pharmacological um, drugs. It included um, keeping the mother active during the time of labor, as opposed to being, you know, when I delivered at St. Joseph, I was told to lie down in bed. And this is back in 1978, things have changed a little bit now, but not encouraged to walk and stay active. Also, they encourage moms to use other than flat on their back uh, birthing positions. And um, they also encouraged uh, what I call women-centered, family-centered birthing. So when they were birthing at home in Alabama, women would gather, right? And I also learned in Africa, um, the same tradition held. One of the more interesting traditions that black midwives sustained in the United States was what I call um, is similar to the ritual of a naming ceremony. And the naming ceremonies, um, I learned a lot about when I was on the continent, but midwives in Alabama would call it the uh, midwife coming back to take the mother up taking the mother up. So I would say to them, well, what is taking the mother up? So they would say, oh, it would be the seventh day or the ninth day after the birth. And we would come back and we would suggest that the mother take a thimble of water and walk around the house um, maybe three times, maybe sing a hymn. And sometimes the midwife would follow the mom walking around the house. And when I was on the continent, I learned about naming ceremonies, which also happened on the seventh or the ninth day, uh, which also involved um, circling, right? Uh, which also involved spiritual um, singing or practice or chanting um, and prayer. That's the other one. Oh my goodness, spiritual connections. The spiritual connections on the continent reflecting their own uh, African traditions and spiritual practices, whether it be Muslim practices or traditional practices, our midwives here in the States also sustain the idea of bringing prayer, bringing spirituality into the birthing space because these were, these were shared uh, practices among uh, women in the community. Um, and, and some of these women were known also in their communities as Sunday school teachers, as choir directors, et cetera. But nearly, I think every single midwife that I interviewed in Alabama talked about humming, talk about preparing to go out on a birth, um, having some kind of a spiritual practice prior to, and continuing those spiritual practices during the actual birthing event. So of course, on the continent, I was hearing pretty much in terms of their own spiritual practices, how they integrated spirituality into the, into the birthing practice. One more example is the use of massage, or two more examples, use of massage. Um, the women in Kenya, who I met, the midwives, were so adept at being able to use massage, not just to comfort um, and relax the mother, but also massage to turn the baby. Um, and position the baby for, um, for birth. And maybe I can read, um, I just remember I had a bookmark here. I can read from the book, um, an interview that I did. The only male that I interviewed while I was there in Alabama was a pastor who was also very much involved with the civil rights movement in Montgomery, uh, working very, very closely with Dr. Martin Luther King when he was um, perishing the, the church there. Um, he was, his life was threatened at one point. But his mother, 
who was a midwife. And he had a chance to observe his mother um, providing a massage, not only for comfort, but also as a way to position the mother um, for birthing. And I'm gonna read just a little bit from George, George Washington Carver Richardson's testimony about his mother, his grandmother. Um, my friend Gwen Patton, who was also very involved with the civil rights movement, told me that I needed to interview her pastor because her pastor frequently talked about um, his grandmother and her spiritual strength and, and, and her towering presence in the community. Um, the other tradition that his grandmother continued was the burial of the afterbirth following um, the, the birth that a man would be asked to dig a hole and to bury the afterbirth. And I actually, I don't, I'm not able to show it today, but I actually filmed um, the ceremony of in Ghana of a, a priest performing the burial of the afterbirth, which was done by placing the afterbirth into a clay pot. And also there was a special hut that oh, was prepared for, for the afterbirth. And when I stood on the ground there, and I write about this in the book, when I stood on the ground there, I thought, oh my goodness, if we think about our ancestors, possibly my ancestors, afterbirths are still part of the soil there, part of the earth. But back to um, Reverend George Washington Carver Richardson, and I think I will read this and take a break because um, my um, I was talking a lot when I was doing the, um, emceeing the amazing panel of senior midwives who practiced in the Caribbean, who practice in Virginia, who practice uh, in the South, but are alarmed about what women are facing um, seeking birthing justice today. But back to this um, passage about massage. I guess that massage was kind of the trademark at that time. I did not know really what was going on until later on, until my mother got into the business. But she would oftentimes massage her, the mother's stomach, and move her stomach around and things like that. You know, her thighs to keep her from having cramps, this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Even back then, olive oil had kind of a religious tone to it. It was used many times in religion to really, you know, to anoint and for prayer and for meditation. My grandmother, many times when she, before she used the oil, would pray. And then she would use that particular oil. Before she massaged the mother, she would pray and read scriptures constantly while the mother was in pain. So I can't help but think that there was some religious significance to it. Mm -hmm. Well, she had twins one time to deliver and seems as if she couldn't get them turned properly. And she worked very hard with the mother. And she oftentimes talked about this like it was her big moment. I don't know what she did, but I know that it worked her very hard because she kept every so often, according to time, she would time herself and she would go there and work with the stomach of the mother with her hands and kept just bathing her down. And whereas other times she wouldn't do it with a system or with some kind of consistency. Now she had the consistency for doing it and every hour on the hour or minute or however she chose to do it, she would just work with that mother and 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 work with that mother. And, that mother. and she had to push one baby around and get the other to come first. She oftentimes talked about that. 
And then when she finally came, both of them came breached. And that was real difficult because then she had a problem of trying to keep the baby's neck from being broken. And she thought probably the second baby would come normal. But it came breached too, and she had to reshape the second baby's head after it had gotten here, after the baby had gotten here. Her hands became beautiful when she was doing the work on the mother. She had circular motions and her hands, her hands, her hands looking like the hands of God. A very, very different picture from the pictures that we see that were stereotypic, that were um, racist, that were um, not respectful of black women's skills. Um, we see frequently the pictures of the granny midwife. And so going to Alabama and recognizing that these women had skills, they had saved lives, and they also had preserved traditions through the horrors of the of enslavement through um, before enslavement through the Middle Passage, um, through Jim Crow, through efforts to eradicate their practices, and I just left a ballroom of a hundred um, black midwives uh, who are continuing um, these traditions now. So I would like for questions to come and comments that um, we take a long time to ask so that I can take a break. Is the moderator there and ready to open up for questions? Yes, indeed. Uh, first and foremost, thank you so very much for sharing these insights with us. Uh, certainly, I've learned a lot today, as I'm sure others have as well. We did receive a couple questions, and I'd like to start with one from Joe Lampert. And Joe Lampert asks, what political action is being undertaken to address the failures of the medical system? And who is undertaking it? Yeah. Well, when I did the work back in 1981, um, and when I was giving birth myself back in 1978, there was recognition of health disparities in terms of outcome. Um, and it's important to remember that even during Booker T. Washington's Tuskegee years, um, there was a call for, um, you know, Negro Health Week, um, not lo just looking at birth outcomes, but just looking at disparities in general. So there has been an awareness for a very long time about health disparities. When I was working in the Office of Minority and Multicultural Health, um, we were saying that babies were two to three times more likely to die than black babies and white babies. And there was some money put into um, Health Start, I think it was called. And we did some things like um, we had a grant from the Ford Foundation where we were able to hire a handful, literally maybe less than 10 outreach workers to help mothers um, enroll in care. And we see that now um, kind of being transformed with the care the doulas provide. But it was really a drop in the, in a, it was a drop in the bucket as the expression goes. Um, the funding was minimal. Um, we had a cultural competency class that we did and we required that Health Start providers participate in it, but there was no way that we could enforce that. And the only healthcare providers who would come to those events would be um, nurses or some midwives, because we were told that doctors would not attend any kind of forum or lecture unless a doctor was delivering the content of the lecture. So 
even though we had cultural competency training then, um, you know, 15 years ago, the doctors were saying, no, not for us. So where we are now, um, I think we're in a, in a very critical moment, in a moment that has not occurred before in terms of the awareness and in terms of the movement. Um, there has certainly been um, an awakening, to, um, and I think Beyonce and Serena's um, problems in terms of how they were cared for and treated as black women who were not, um, we targeted with Health Start low income, Medicaid eligible women. And the awakening that happened is that all black women are at risk for mistreatment, whether you're poor, whether you're middle class, whether you're a movie star, whether you're a, a, a billionaire. If you're black, there are risks associated with birthing um, in, in, in a hospital with a doctor. Um, so I think the birthing justice movement has really succeeded in making the call and the, and the awakening. I think the solutions though, and the, uh, what's, what will work to change the outcome is very, very complicated. And I think one of the things is not to simplify the answer because we also know that infant mortality measures is used in public health as a measure of the well-being of the entire community. So the United States as compared to other, um, the wh white women in the United States as compared to white women in Europe have poor outcomes, right? Than the ones, than white women in Europe. But for black women, when it's three times, four times higher, that what we're looking at, not only the, the you know, the racism, and the lack of uh, cultural competency on the part of the providers. But we're also looking at the community as a whole and looking at um, the, the factors like, you know, access to quality food, um, access for places to walk and to be healthy. Um, so the whole idea of healthy community um, is also part of healthy birthing. Um, so that's, that's um, a far more complicated and um, not an easy um, goal to reach. But I think what I was reminded of by being at this conference today, that midwives are an important part of the solution because midwives value listening. Um, they, are, they value bonding with the mother um, prior to the birth, they value um, inappropriate interventions, which can cause, um, can put a mother at risk. Um, they value family-centered care, and they are, they value um, listening. Um, I write in my book how Rosie Aaron Smith, was I kind of dedicated the book to her because she was the one that just reminded me how important it is to listen. Um, and and when, when I sat with her on the porch, I just felt that um, she cared, you know, she was caring and she was a listener. And I can imagine that as a midwife, that she would also be um, a listener. Um, I think removing some of the barriers to women becoming midwives, um, I was told at this conference that now, there are some places that, you know, if you don't have a PhD in nurse midwifery, um, then your practices are not um, permitted in their hospitals. What? <laughs> uh, birth centers, um, I think, are another space that need to be more supported um, because they are dedicated to, to birthing, um, because it's a home-like environment. Um, the hospital space itself can be stressful. And because for the most part, it's midwives who are providing the care in the uh, birthing space. And my book doesn't go into the statistics and the data about nurse midwifery and midwifery outcomes, but there is data now to support that the outcomes of midwifery care um, are certainly equal and sometimes better than um, in, in normal childbirth than, um, than medical 
doctor care. The midwives at UMD and J used to joke that the, um, I used to sit in their meetings that they would talk about the medical students, that they trained the medical students, um, you know, that they gave the medical students their, their, um, the skills that they had. It wasn't really coming from other doctors. It was coming from the midwives. Wow. Well, I mean, I, obviously there's much to be said about the care taken by midwives, black midwives in particular, uh, as you can more personally relate to the experiences of your patients. Um, as you've already indicated, there are a number of injustices that mothers face, uh, black mothers in particular, um, in the medical industry, uh, especially as it relates to childbirth. So given these occurrences of racial injustice in the field of medicine, uh, often resulting in harms and undue loss of life for expectant mothers and or their unborn children, what are some steps that these mothers can take to advocate for themselves, especially when it comes to uh, being given treatments or medicines that they don't necessarily agree with, but are simply expected to accept? Well, I would recommend first finding out whether there are any midwives in your community, whether there is a birth center in your community, and to find out if you are someone who would do well in that kind of a setting. There are women who might have um, health issues that would not make a birth uh, center space or a midwife supported space the ideal space. Um, what If you're having a baby in the hospital, um, ask if there are nurse midwives on board and ask um, how you can meet with the nurse midwives and, and talk with the nurse midwife to find out whether it's possible for you to um, be under a nurse midwife's care. Um, I think the other um, thing that's important is to um, always self-educate, right? <laughs> Read as much as you can. There's lots on the internet. There's um, lots on, um, and particularly now with the birthing justice movement, what, you know, finding ways to stay well and be well, um, because that's really preparing for childbirth is like, you know, it's, it's a lifetime preparation preparing for childbirth. So, you know, like ways to be healthy and stay healthy. Um, I'm very supportive of doulas. Um, we are seeing for the first time that in some states, I think New Jersey might be one of the states, that doulas are being reimbursed through Medicaid, if you're Medicaid eligible, um, which is a, is a real uh, gain, which wasn't the case when I was in the Office of Minority and Multicultural Health. Um, doulas can be very, very supportive um, in terms of, uh, in the prenatal period, accompanying you to your doctor's visit or your midwife's visit. Um, it's hard to remember all the questions you want to ask. It's hard to um, know um, how to champion yourself when you're in the midst of labor. Um, so it's good to have someone there who's not only being your advocate, but is also providing you with comforting techniques such as massage. We talked about the, I talked about the black midwives and um, the spiritual practice. So, so, you know, whatever your spiritual practice might be, the doula can help support you in, in those practices in terms of calming. Um, so my suggestion really is, and I think the other thing I just learned from someone recently that, um, I think it was, I don't remember which hospital it is now, but it's in the Plainfield area. But she had had, um, her granddaughter had been born um, with complications and had to be in the neonatal nursery. And she was told that she was, you know, of course she wanted to spend the night there, but the only way that she, she could not have an, uh, anyone else with her, the mother could not have anyone else with her. My grandson was born early in Virginia and I got on a plane and got here as fast as I could and I stayed for a couple of weeks while he was in the neonatal nursery. It's hard if you're a mom by yourself. Imagine if you're a teenage mom by yourself and you need to be you need to be there to supervise what's going on with your baby. See how often that they're you know whether they're doing what they need to be doing. It's tiring physically and emotionally and to be there by yourself. I think one of the things that's needed is for folks in Plainfield to do, to develop a checklist of what 
you know, and I think you can easily find a checklist or talk to midwives about developing a checklist. What can a hospital do to make sure that they're doing everything possible to support women, to support families in their in, in caring for, for newborns and caring for the family, you know, promoting breastfeeding, all of those things on the checklist. Um, and I think that's something that you don't have to be a mother or be pregnant to do. I think that that would be an excellent, excellent strategy um, for um, involvement in the birthing justice movement. Um, you know, there's legislation. I know there's some really excellent legislation now in New Jersey. So find out what that legislation is um, around um, increasing training programs for, for midwives in New Jersey, um, finding out whether it's possible, whether all hospitals in New Jersey that have maternity care programs are welcoming to nurse midwifery practices here in Hampton. Um, just recently, Sentara um, hired two nurse midwives, but that's was the first time Sentara has been here for ages. So there are all kinds of ways, and, and, the, and the best way to develop that checklist is to find a midwife in your community who is willing to, you know, do a, a Zoom call or a Zoom meeting or whatever to say, here are some ideas about what I think we need to be doing to um, increase the quality of care that Black women are receiving in our in our town. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for those insights. Uh, I think that we will take you up on the advice of preparing and helping to develop that checklist. I think that would be a tremendous help, um, especially as healthcare and access there too even becomes more limited as we progress, especially in the area of Plainfield. Uh, we do have a question here that's coming from John Brinkley. Your fellow Brinkley is asking, is there a particular sanctioning body for midwives? Oh, okay. Um, so there are different uh, routes to becoming a midwife. Um, the American College of Nurse Midwives is the accrediting um, organization for nurse midwives, um, and there's a you know there's a board exam, et cetera, et cetera. And the I mentioned the program, the educational program at the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey, where I uh, was on the faculty, um, is a accredited nurse midwifery program. So the American College of Nurse Midwives. But there are also a number of, of um, what are called direct entry midwife programs, which um, the conference that I'm attending now, it's called the Black Midwife Conference. And there are um, programs in schools, which I cannot uh, list, but, uh, but they're easy to find, where um, women are provided the, the curriculum and also an opportunity for apprenticeships um, following an experienced midwife um, prior to becoming a midwife. But what the question really gets to the root of would be in New Jersey, and I can't speak to that because all the states are different. Um, what are the, what is the criteria to practice, first of all, as a midwife in a hospital? Um, that is accredited by the state of New Jersey. Um, and I, my sense is that that might also apply to birth centers, but each state has a very specific um, laws that talk about um, the different categories of midwives and who is eligible for midwifery practice in hospital versus home birth midwives. And the other issue is insurance. So um, nurse midwives probably have the longest history of having some um, reimbursement for their insurance reimbursement for their care. Um, but that's an ongoing, ongoing issue. But I think a Google of New Jersey midwifery legislation um, would bring up the laws, and there are definitely laws in New Jersey about who qualifies to practice, particularly in hospital settings, and um, as well as in home settings, because the, the midwife also has to have, um, like a doctor would have, you know, the ability to know that her practice is being protected and that she's being protected as well. Got it. 
Well, very good. I thank you for sharing that. There's one additional question, but before we finalize with that last question, I would love to share the video that you brought. Um, yeah, I, let me just say it's going to be kind of a real shift, but I think that doing the work that I did in Alabama, doing the work I did in Africa, I, I really and I'm really um, looking at um, the United Nations as being the most progressive and the most forward thinking about protecting and encouraging midwifery practices. Um, for example, they have just uh, begun a new initiative in Africa um, to increase um, opportunities for midwives to acquire additional training, but also to recognize their existing skills and their existing um, successes. Um, and to say, that the solution, the United Nations has said, the solution for improving birthing outcomes in Africa, and I would add around the world, is midwives. It's, it, that's, that, and so that there needs to be more opportunity for um, midwifery, uh, regenerating the midwifery tradition, but honoring the midwifery traditions and having a more integrative approach in terms of honor, not wiping them out, but honoring the, the traditions and those aspects of value from the medical, uh, medical practices being included and also being able to have access for quality care if needed um, at the time of birth. But the solution that the United Nations is talking about is more midwives, not more doctors, more midwives. And I would agree that more, and I'm going to be very specific about this, more black midwives, more indigenous the midwives, the Native American community actually has the highest infant mortality rate. In the, it exceeds the, the black infant mortality and maternal mortality rate. The, the clip that, the clip that um, I asked to be shown um, relates to what's going on now in the Gaza Strip, because I was just reminded that um, the issue of, of midwives and traditional traditional midwives are in the Gaza Strip, they're in India, they're in Asia, they're you know around the world. This doctors in the birthing space that happened in the early 20th century. And, and around the world, most women do not have a doctor at birth. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as my friend said, uh, in Kenya, he said, you know what? I hadn't thought about it this way, but midwives have been attending births since the beginning of time on the continent. And there are millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of babies born successfully, right? Everyone alive practically was, if it wasn't them, it was their mother or their grandmother that was attended by a midwife. So that really says a lot for the story. But I I'm sure as many on the on this call are, you know, I've just been devastated by what's going on in the Gaza Strip and the, and the inability to come to ceasefire. But because of the way that I've been thinking um, a lot about midwives, I did learn that, uh, about traditional midwives um, on the Gaza Strip. And I just, just as a reminder, and, you know, as we think about the Black experience, um, to think about what's going on in Haiti, to think about what's going on in the Sudan, but also to think about it in terms of birthing in midwives. And so you can show that clip. Very short. Awesome. All right. Let's see this up. So I'm here on a joint WHO unit. I'm just going to share it this way. So I'm here on a joint WHO UNFPA high-risk mission to 
the Nasser uh, Hospital and the newly created UNRWA uh, Field Hospital, which is going to deal with the overflow. What we saw in Nasser Hospital, we're seeing a 200% capacity. And we went to the specific um, maternity ward and speaking with the midwives and the obstetric teams, a lot of the trauma cases which are getting referred to Nasser Hospital in Khan Yunis are overwhelming the capacities. What the midwives who I spoke to told us that they're tired. They themselves can't see their own families. The head of the hospital said he visits his, uh, his wife and his children for two hours once a week. So they're exhausted. They, uh, they demand uh, for a ceasefire for this, uh, for this to end. And after the ceasefire, they need supplies. They need reinforcements. They need water. They need fuel to be able to, to uh, generate the hospital. We've delivered these, some of these supplies uh, to NASA Hospital directly. This is one, one of a number of missions which UNFPA has been uh, doing to deliver the, the much needed supplies for maternal health and to ensure safe births. The midwives told us that they're dealing with around 25 births every day in the NASA Hospital, around eight C-sections, and that's way above their normal capacities. So we from UNFPA will continue to be on the ground here and deliver those much needed supplies and uh, provide our solidarity and support to the heroic work of the midwives and the doctors delivering safe births in Khan Yunis and in Gaza. I just thought of a new slogan for the movement. <laughs> it's, it's kind of like calling for a ceasefire on black mothers and black babies, right? Wow. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it, it's fitting, obviously. Uh, it's so unfortunate that with the injustices that are perpetuated against black mothers, black babies, uh, blacks at large, generally there's this consensus where as a people, we should just get over it, you know, and, and get beyond it. And that's speaking about things historically, the tragedies that have occurred during the transatlantic slave trade and beyond thereafter, to things that happened just a week ago. You know, there's this expectation that we have this profound resilience that we shouldn't be impacted by these tragedies. And it's just really a, a sad state of affairs where, unfortunately, some of us just abide by that expectation while others find that our hands are often tied. Uh, that said, though, it leads me to the other question that came in, and, and this is coming in from Joe Lamford again. Uh, he asks, what efforts are now being taken to support black midwives? He has a, a multi-part question. The next is, what research would you recommend that he reads to learn about black midwives? And finally, he's just wondering if you differentiate midwifery between doula work. Um, I do have a website, which has lots of um, information on it about black midwives. Okay. Uh, which is basically my name. It's Linda J. Holmes.net. Um, and so I would refer to that. Um, there is a midwifery program at Rutgers University um, in Newark. And I don't know the name of the director. I'm not living there any longer. But you certainly can reach out to that program um, who can provide with information. The American College of Nurse Midwives is based in Washington, DC. There is a journal of nurse midwifery um, that has excellent articles that relate to research in terms of birthing outcomes um, that midwives have provided. Um, you can Google the conference that I'm attending now, which is the Black Midwives, I, I don't know if it's network or organization, but there is so much that will come up in the Google around Black midwives, but those are some specific examples. Um, and a lot will come up around birthing justice as well. Um, and some of the things on my website include some videos, um, you know, interviews with midwives. Um, and um, I'm also on LinkedIn. Um, and there's, you know, if you are interested in midwives doing research and things like that, that's a, a good source for um, you know that and certainly i'm on linkedin and i haven't been posting a lot recently but you know when i get a chance i try to post articles there as well but i would recommend um the rutgers nurse midwife program would be a, a really good first stop shopping kind of place in terms of knowing what's going on in new jersey 
And I, I think that there's there's a pretty lively movement. I'm in Virginia, but there's a pretty lively movement in New Jersey right now. Um, I don't think it'll be hard to link into that when we you know, start playing with midwife uh, projects in New Jersey. I think a lot will come up. What was the other question? Uh, the other was related to what support was being taken or given to black midwives? What efforts are being taken to support them? Uh, you answered the question about the research. Oh, the last one was whether you differentiate between midwives and doulas. Oh, yeah. Um, I think in some ways it's kind of, it, it's really interesting. So doulas uh, provide care during pregnancy and during the birthing process. This is the, this is the easiest answer, but they do not, um, they're not, their training is not to deliver the baby. That oh. is the work of the midwife. So the doula might be doing a massage. She might be providing comfort in various ways. She might be accompanying the mother on the birth. She might be providing uh, follow-up visits to the mother, making you know she needs childcare, linking to other services. Um, she is that um, you know that support person, but she's not the person who is providing the prenatal care or the direct birthing care. Okay. All right. Well, I think that satisfies all of the questions that came in. I want to thank you again for taking <laughs> to join us. Uh, I know that you are extremely busy. Your work, of course, is taking you places and putting you in spaces that are quite demanding. And so I want to be respectful of your time. Oh, and let me just, oh, if you want to know more about anything, read my book. <laughs> there, you go. there you go. That's right. David and my I, hands. <laughs> I also shared a link to the book for all okay. of those who are watching us live. Be sure to grab you a copy of this riveting book, Safe in the Midwife's Hands, Birthing Traditions from Africa to the American South. Uh, you will not regret it. Um, as you can see, Linda shared a couple passages today, and I'm already keenly interested in getting my copy. So I will be the first to that, to purchase mine immediately following this broadcast. I know my wife is going to love it too. Uh, but thank you again so very much, Linda. We are so appreciative of all that you do and are doing. And if there's anything else that we can do to help support, let us know when we are there. Thank right. you very much. Thank you. Awesome. Bye. Bye now. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for joining us today. We are Frontiers International Planned for the Area Club. As you've just witnessed, we held a lecture today with Linda Holmes. Uh, she is an expert and professional um, midwife who is leading the charge for birthing justice, which is a movement in itself that should not be ignored or uh, undermined or, or understated in any way, because there is birthing injustice that currently exists that plagues us, plagues our wives, our mothers, our loved ones, uh, and the rates of morbidity for us are just far too high for us to ignore the need for birthing justice. If you would like to support our work and donate to our scholarship fund or donate to our scholarship fund, you can do so online at bit.ly forward slash Plainfield Frontiers donate bit.ly forward slash Plainfield Frontiers donate. That link is available in the chat. Uh, please do follow it if you would like to partner with us. You can also send your contributions. If you do not have means to do so online, you can mail them by check made payable to Frontiers International Plainfield, PO Box 428 Plainfield, New Jersey 07061. Uh, we are a 501c3 organization, and all contributions uh, that are qualified to our fund uh, are deductible for tax purposes. We appreciate your partnership. We look forward to seeing you again soon, and I thank you for joining us on today. I bid you adieu. Have a great day.